All right, so um, the purpose of today's uh, lecture is assessing fitness levels in the clinical setting. Um, a lot of times at these conferences, we've spoken um, in as far as what we do at Cynogenics, um, being VO2 max tests um, and maximal, you know, absolute um, values. Uh, we do DEXA scan analysis, carotid intermediate thickness scans, and um, that's all excellent information. It's very valuable for our patients and for what we do. Um, but the question we get uh, a lot of from uh, physicians is, what kind of test can I do in my practice? I don't have a lot of extra, you know, capital to buy the DEXA scan or buy the IMT or buy a $30,000 VO2 equipment. Um, so we're going to look at a couple different options that you can do to assess fitness levels in your patients. All right, so again, we're going to review a few components of the health-related and physical fitness and uh, discuss the procedures that are appropriate um, for your practice. Um, the goals for fitness assessment, uh, two of them are for you, two of them are for your patients. Um, one's for clean data collection, um, also how you're going to stratify risk of the patients. Um, but as far as the patients go and how their care goes, you want to educate them on what they're looking at, letting them know a little bit more about different measures of fitness. Um, and education is power. That's going to help motivate them and help them be accountable and reach the goals that they're setting. All right, you obviously want to be organized when you're doing any type of diagnostic assessments. Um, in terms of VO2 equipment, if you go as far as purchasing, you know, very costly uh, VO2 equipment like what we use uh, being a parvomedic system, um, that can be hourly calibrations. Um, for the system we see down here that we'll be using later today, uh, you need to calibrate that system every four hours if you're going to be using it continuously throughout the day. Um, other systems you can just do in the morning, um, but there's other options that you need. Um, the sequential scheduling of tests, what that means is, I think Dr. Lake spoke on it earlier, if we do a um, curl-up test or that crunch test prior to that plank test, plank test can be fairly limited if the person is not fully recovered. So if you really want to look at cardiorespiratory fitness, um, you might want to put that test first before you're doing some other assessments, maybe one rep max or grip strength. Um, and you also want your patients to complete a informed consent form. Um, American College of Sports Medicine and American Heart Association um, teamed up and put together a questionnaire that's available for download for free online. If you want to use that, um, there's a lot of studies behind it. And ACSM, that's their go-to um, questionnaire. All right, you obviously want to be prepared. Um, you want to provide pretest instructions to the patients. A lot of times when I see patients in the morning, um, I actually get the first, you know, I'm the first person they're speaking with before they start a full assessment. Um, I'll let them know what we're doing for their tests and breaking down each individual step. Uh, a lot of times people are nervous when you tell them that they're going to be doing an exercise test, so you want to make them as comfortable as possible. And the best way to do that is to educate them, let them know everything that's coming their way. Um, any questions they have, you want to make sure you address them thoroughly. Uh, make sure those questions are answered so that there's no question whatsoever when the time comes to perform that test so you get the best values. Um, and another thing you can look into is standardizing the testing environment. If there's a lot of changes going on throughout the office um, from person to person, obviously that can affect your testing scores. Um, this is necessary for validity and reliability. Um, the, value, the, the tests we're going to be doing today and showing you today are ones that you can do that might not provide an absolute value that you can use for a lot of diagnosis, um, but it's good for testing and retesting and tracking progression for your patient. Um, so you'll see if they are advancing in their fitness levels. Um, so you want to make sure that everything is the same when they come back in and repeat those tests. Um, a lot of patients can be an uh, anxious or they can have emotional disturbances. Um, someone could have eaten something and they, they don't really feel that great. Um, maybe they need to use the restroom before they perform the test, but they didn't want to say anything. Um, if it's too cold or if it's too humid in the room. Um, and uh, what kind of clothing they're wearing. If someone's coming in to do a VO2 test and they're wearing shorts and a tank top, and the next time they come in and they're wearing sweatpants and a jacket, obviously they're going to be not as comfortable as they were previously when they performed that test. So you want to be able to mimic that throughout the progression. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to minimize those variables. Um, when you speak to patients, you want to speak with a relaxed confidence. Um, when, you're when you're describing uh, the tests and the instructions, be calm. No matter what's going on outside of that consult with your patient, um, don't let that affect you. You know, teach them thoroughly. Let them know what's going on. Um, and you also want to give them a little bit of time to do some pre-testing um, protocols, possibly. Uh, Dr. Willick spoke about meditation earlier today. If you want to give the patient maybe 15 minutes after they've learned everything about the test they're going to be performing so that they can use that time to use the restroom or to meditate and just focus and let their resting heart rate get down, um, that would be a wise idea. You also want to standardize the room temperature. That's a fairly easy one, just setting the thermostat. Um, and also, before someone comes in, you do want to suggest that they uh, wear a certain type of apparel. Uh, before someone comes into our office, we let them know that they're going to be doing light to moderate exercise. Um, so we do want them to be comfortable in wearing exercise clothes. 
if someone comes in unknowingly wearing, you know, dress pants and, um, you know, a suit jacket, they're going to be a little uncomfortable right from the get-go because they don't want to get really sweaty in their clothing. All right. So the points of interest we're going to look at today are um, body composition, cardiorespiratory fitness or cardiopulmonary fitness, however you want to say it, uh, muscular endurance, muscular strength, and also flexibility. So body composition, um, this can be either done with field techniques. If you've seen a health fair done at a university or at an employer, um, they can do various types of body composition tests um, just at a, you know, in a room like this. Um, but there's also laboratory settings you can do, things like underwater weighing, DEXA scan analysis, bod pod analysis. Those are all more done in a lab. Um, obviously, the methods vary in complexity, accuracy, and cost. As the accuracy goes up, it's going to cost a lot more. Um, bod pods, I believe, are in the range of $30,000 and upwards. DEXA scans, they have a new technology out that's close to around eighty dollars to $100,000. Um, it actually measures um, central adiposity. Um, and the more expensive it gets, the more you're going to be working with techs. Um, so if you are in a lab setting and you are doing DEXA scans and bod pod analysis, you are going to have a technician um, that's going to be trained in that piece of equipment for testing and retesting. Um, a couple ones that you can do for body composition, circumference measurements are very simple. Um, you only need a tape measure. Skin fold measurements, um, you only need one piece of equipment, but your person does need to be uh, skilled in collecting skin fold measurements. Um, Lang calipers are typically used. They can run anywhere from $200 to $300. Um, Bioelectrical impedance, this one has a broad range of costs. Um, you could go to probably an athletic store out here, maybe like a sporting goods store, and find a handheld bioelectrical impedance test um, analysis uh, grip grip holder. Um, what that'll do, that'll send a model electrical current through the body and it actually measures body composition. Um, the handheld ones that you can find at a common store are going to be around $60, but you can get far in advance with um, a Tanita scale that has a digital scale for the feet and also the hands that sends the same electrical current, but those cost upwards of possibly $3,000 if you get a newer model. So the range is different, obviously the accuracy is different. Um, underwater weighing. Underwater weighing starts to get expensive as well. Again, this can be in the tens of thousands of dollars. Um, I don't know too many uh, labs or companies that are doing age management that have underwater weighing um, technology because it's, it's costly and it's, you know, it's a lot to keep up with, um, filling the water, cleaning the water. Um, but universities will have that, and you can get that done at a local university. Um, Plethysmography, um, that's going to be your air displacement. So underwater weighing is going to be water displacement, and then the bod pod analysis, pea pod analysis, that's going to be air displacement. And the one that I'm most familiar with um, due to my position is the DEXA scan analysis. We complete that on all of our patients. It's highly accurate and it's comfortable for our patients. All right, so looking into cardiorespiratory fitness, how we're going to measure that. Um, we can look at submaximal exercise tests and we'll get into maximal exercise tests as well. Um, there are advantages to submaximal exercise testing. Um, it's inexpensive, it doesn't really acquire a lot of equipment, um, it's low cost. It uh, allows for more testing, so if someone wants to come in maybe every month to test, it's not going to cost you a lot. And um, it's fairly quick. You're not going to be doing 20-minute tests. Um, however, there are obviously disadvantages that we have up on here. Um, maximal measurements are not collected, so you can't look at the data you're collecting from a submaximal exercise test as an absolute value because it's going to be predicted. Um, VO2 max prediction error is roughly between 10 and 20 percent, um, and more often I've seen values higher than that, more like the 20 to 30 percent um, prediction error. Um, it is going to limit your diagnostic utility um, for coronary heart disease, um, and also it does limit the use for exercise prescription. Um, so after we go over those disadvantages, you start to wonder, you know, why should I even do these tests? But again, for tracking the patient's progression and having them build up confidence, even if the test isn't giving them the most accurate data, but over a course of six months, they see that they are getting more and more fit. It's going to be valuable to them. Valuable to them. It's going to keep them accountable, and it's going to be wanting them to take it to the next level.